Yeah, it's about the MGCP protocol and after that we, uh, I will show you some uh, practical applications uh, um, how we uh, are utilizing that protocol. Uh, I'm not sure um, uh, how familiar you are with MGCP, but if you uh, ever have used uh, F, uh, the split, uh, the Osmo BSC split branches, you, you uh, already had, have some experience with it because uh, the Osmo MGW or the Osmo, MC, M, Osmo BSC MGCP is uh, mandatory there, so we need to switch the voice streams somehow. Um, MGCP stands for Media Gateway uh, Control Protocol. Um, and there are some successors. This, uh, I looked it up. It's the SGCP uh, and the IPDC. And uh, as, as you can see there, it's um, um, Cisco and uh, Bell, Core, and uh, Level 3 that are the uh, three major uh, figures in there who uh, um, basically uh, were the driving force behind that. And yeah, it became an ITEF standard in 2003, so it's uh, not exactly a very old uh, protocol. So it's uh, already appeared in the zero years. Uh, the, uh, the, you know, uh, the GSM protocol, the protocols we use in the GSM, uh, especially in 2G, are much older, of course. Um, yeah, and also uh, MGCP uh, includes. Uh, uh, Another protocol, which is the SDP, you also have these SDP uh, messages in SIP, so you already might know that. Um, so um, this is basically um, an extension uh, to the to the um, MGCP to describe the session further. Um, so they didn't invent a new protocol there, so I just included that. Um, so the intended use of MGCP is switching. Um, but also media conversion and um, transcoding, um, at least what, that's what has have happened inside the media gateway. Um, the classic, uh, classic thing where MGCP, we would use MGCP is you would have some media gateway and that's, uh, that's uh, uh, yeah, they, you you have to take them by the word. It's a uh, it's, it's a gateway that converts the RTP, an RTP stream to let's say an E1 line or or an analog phone line, and you would uh, send your MGCP messages there, set up the connection, and uh, then your RTP stream would would be routed over pods. Um, we use it a uh, um, a little different, um, not, not very classic. We have uh, RTP streams uh, everywhere. At the moment, at least, yeah. And of course, um, if you use RTP with different codecs, you would, would require transcoding, which is not yet uh, implemented, but it's a, a planned feature. And uh, also the media conversion in in the sense of uh, converting something to completely different media, like E1, uh, is also a planned feature. Um, yeah. Um, so um, MGCP is a, a text-based protocol. It's made up pretty simple. Um, you see at the uh, at the right is uh, some example for an MGCP request, uh, as it would show up in Wireshark and uh, at the. Uh, ah, I really have the po pointer here. So that's uh, how the um, how it would look like on the wire. So a pretty simple ASCII text, um, but you have to. Pay a little attention about the um, line breaks. Um, yeah, that's specified, so you uh, don't have to, uh, must not use uh, any um, um, arbitrary line break com uh, com uh, combinations. Um, but yeah, that's that's how it looks like on the wire. Um, it's basically when I when I did my first experiments with that, uh, I Ooh. I um, did. Um, I just uh, made up a text file and uh, used netcat and piped it down there and that that would already work um, to control the media gate. Of course, there are, um, as we go through later, there are more comfortable ways to do that. Um, yeah, it's request response uh, um, oriented, um, which means basically you, you send in a response and uh, you send in a request and and you get a response to that. So there's a, there are fixed roles. Uh, you have 
you have a client or also it's also called a call agent that, that requests something at the MGW, do, makes that connection, uh, modifies that connection, deletes that connection, and then you get responses. Um, yeah, and it runs on UDP port 24, 27, that, um, yeah. Um, MGCP messages are uh, uh, basically begin sort of with, with the command word and um, and some other stuff you will later you see later. But uh, there are a variety of command words uh, available, and um, in uh, in our setups we, we use only three of them, which are basically the three most important: which is create a connection, modify a connection, and delete the connection again. And so, of course, there are also others, so for example, the audit endpoint, which could be quite interesting if you want to uh, request the um, the properties of what you have set up there, but we don't need that at the moment. I think also MGW would respond to that, but not very verbose, I think. Um, and this is basically um, what happens inside our MGW um, when a connection is fully set up. Um, we have basically an endpoint. Uh, it's important to know an uh, in, in a media gateway always uh, always consists of a series of endpoints. If uh, if you would have the classic setup with, with your pods lines, for example, you would have if you have a media gateway with ten pods lines, for example, you would have ten endpoints. Then, um, of course, with, RT, with as we are in all in an all RTP setup, it's uh, this is somehow more virtualized, so we could have an uh, arbitrary configurable number of endpoints here, and each endpoint has these, uh, these descriptions, these basically these paths here. RTP branch sets our, our series uh, of, of RTP endpoints. We plan also have to run endpoints uh, in the future, and there, of course, the, the, the path would look uh, a little different. And um, the other, uh, the uh, um, the URL behind the ad is basically an identifier for the MGW itself. Um, yeah, on, on that endpoint, you, you create connection. It's two of them. Um, you basically have, um, um, you do your CRCX, your create connection command, and correct the, you con set up the first connection, and then you set up the second connection, and they implicitly find each other if they are connected on the same endpoint. So, if you want to route an RTP stream, you have to co create uh, two connections on one endpoint, and they will find each other and route your RTP stream through. Um, it's basically the, uh, the model we uh, implement um, on our media gateway there. Um, yeah. Um, let's look a bit at um, at a, a request response example uh, of uh, of an MGCP uh, request. Um, yeah. So here, this is a create connection command, the CR6, um, um, which which creates a connection. Um, it also gets a transaction ID. That's um, n uh, that's nothing. Uh, uh, that's just a, a counter um, which uh, basically then makes uh, adds some uniqueness, uh, makes your message distinguishable from recent. So it gives your um, message a, a distinguishable number, which uh, basically just increments. But more importantly, we have this uh, endpoint description here again. RTP bridge slash zero, and this basically um, means that we have selected uh, endpoint number zero here. Um, yeah, and we also specify uh, a call ID. Um, this call ID thing is um, basically to uh, make calls distinguishable. Um, it's technically not so important, it's more like to add some plausibility. So if you create a call with, with the call ID 2, and if you want to modify the call again with call ID 3, the media gateway should uh, say that's not okay, it's an error. Um, 
So each call gets an ID. And we specify that if this is the first connection we create and we set the call ID to two, we have to keep it until the connection ends. <coughs> and yeah, here we set up some uh, uh, a laser pointer would be much uh, better, I think, but I don't have one. Um, uh, yeah, here's the codec setup. My talk is more focused on the switching aspect um, rather than the uh, c uh, codec and transcoding aspect. Um, as I have uh, uh, dealt uh, so far with connection the most. Um, yeah, basically what it says, it's just uh, create a connection with 20 milliseconds interval, packetization interval, a codec should be RMR, AMR, and it should be a send-receive connection. So it's not a loopback connection here, so it's uh, in uh, send-receive mode. So, um, And we also give it a, uh, we attach a, uh, an SCP uh, uh, footer here which uh, specifies um, on which port and IP we expect the uh, MGW to, uh, to send the RTP data to us. So that's basically, uh, in that situation, we already uh, reserved the port on our side and we want to tell that to the uh, MGW so it can forward its RTP data to us. Um, yeah, basically that means yeah, I'm listening. I'm listening on 127.001.8000. Uh, please send all your RTP uh, information to me there. Um, yeah, next slide. And of course we get a response to that. And in this case, we got a, a 200, which means everything was fine, the request was fulfilled, so it's basically uh, HTTP uh, error codes, very, very similar. And we got this, this is a connection identifier we get from the MGW. It's on the MGW's behalf to assign a connection identifier to, to us so that we can later, if we do a modified connection, if we want to delete it, so that we can um, reference to the connection. Um, yeah, so that's uh, basically it. It says, yeah, well, I fulfilled your request. Um, here's your connection identifier. And I am listening on 127 uh, 4004 uh, 4, 4, 4 4 for incoming RTP data. So the MGW, uh, the, the MGW now tells us where it expects us to send RTP data. So then we have uh, one side fully set up and the site is basically ready to receive some RTP data. But uh, of course, we need, would need a second connection. Of course, this is only an example for a single request. So if you just assume there were a message like this, uh, a request response like this before, we would have the two connections now and the RTP could, stream could flow through. Um, here I have uh, some examples of a typical session, so how that would, would look like. It's, um, you basically, it's, it's basically every time it's the same. It uh, starts with the CR6, so it creates a connection. And um, there are some situations where you do not know, know uh, where, to, where you want to receive your, your data yet. So you just basically say into the blue, yeah, create a connection, but I don't know uh, where I expect uh, your RTP data yet. I will tell you that later. And then then creates a connection and the, uh, the Gamer Gateway uh, already tells, uh, reserve support tells uh, it where, where, where it expects the data. And then when you found out where you want your data to be sent, uh, you can modify the connection. And then you would create, for example, a second connection there you already know which, uh, which port you expect the MGW to send the data to, then um, it's only one message. And uh, when you're done with the call, you just delete, uh, um, just delete uh, your um, connection again. You actually can delete normally, uh, yeah, depends. Um, 
you can do a, a sort of uh, wild card at BLCX uh, where you just don't reference to a specific connection. And then it would delete drop all your connections. It would basically release the whole endpoint. Um, or you can say, I have two connections, and I want to delete this connection with that con particular connection ID. So you basically have uh, multiple options there. Um, yeah, and now um, we have a look at some uh, practical examples how we uh, use it. This is a typical situation as we have it with the split branch today. Uh, one sec. If the BSC here, the BSC is connected through an A, uh, A interface to the um, to the uh, um, core network backhaul, and uh, we also have an RTP uh, RTP stream uh, pointing to the backhaul somewhere. Um, and the MGW is uh, um, controlled via MGCP. That is. Uh, sort of orange uh, wire here. Um, yeah, and of course, since it's UDP, it's not a permanent connection. It's basically just a request response. And in this setup, I, in this example, I uh, made up a network with two BTS. And of course, in, if we have two BTSs, we, we might end up having an handover. And yeah. Um, let's uh, do the handover for a moment. So let's assume the mobile is jumping over. And what you already can see here is, whoops, this was one too much. Um, the RTP stream pointing to the core network remains constant. And that is a requirement. So if you do uh, the handover inside uh, our core network the, uh, inside our BSS, uh, the core network is basically not informed about that. The core network doesn't care if there are handovers. So if you, at least in one, uh, if you are connected to, uh, uh, one, uh, B stick to one BSC, so if you have inter-BSC uh, handover, that's a different thing. But the, the normal handover, as you know it, um, would uh, change the RTP stream locations permanently. So there will be MDCX messages to the MGW for each handover. And um, basically, you need to, need to have the uh, RTP connection constant. And that's exactly, exactly what, the RT, what the MGP does, uh, M MGW does here. So it's uh, isolating the BTS RTP streams uh, from the core network and basically makes the core network things. Everything is fine. Everything is uh, stays as you uh, negotiated it on the A interface. Um, yeah, and of course, um, having an MDGP, uh, an MGW there is also uh, good if you later introduce the transcoding. Uh, you could also do trans uh, coding if necessary. So let's say if your BTS to handover uh, to has problems with AMR, for example, which is because it's an older model, you could easily do the trans coding as well. Um, yeah, and we also have um, a co-located MGW to the um, MSC. That's a particular Osmo. Uh, Osmo MSC uh, example, of course, in a third party, with a third party MSC could be different. Um, the MGW is necessary for basically, um, yeah, for tra could, could uh, be a transcoder as well for transcoding um, codecs for the whatever the PBX or what, what the VoIP world out there supports. And it's also, also uh, plays an important role. Uh, when we do um, do uh, the uh, local switching with uh, internal M internal MNCC, ah, see. yeah, yeah, normal. Is this in this example? I have an Osmo SIP connector here, but as you know, you could also have uh, your internal MNCC uh, right built into the you, uh, that is built into the MSC. You could also use that. 
and then you would have you would need to need a switchboard to to switch your RTP things, otherwise it wouldn't work. So yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much the setup I, I run all day when I do a test with the split branches. It's it's like that. And also some more exotic uh, topologies are syncable as well. This is an example from where uh, where it was necessary to uh, overcome some uh, limitations of the link. Um, let's see, application where BSC NUT is involved, um, and there the uh, MGC, MG, MGCP gets tunneled over a satellite link inside an IPA multiplex along with SCP light, gets demultiplexed in the BSC, the BSC forwards it to the uh, MGW, and uh, um, yeah, then things finally get switched. That's just uh, just as a uh, uh, as an example. Okay, now I um, ah we still have a little bit of time. Now I'm through with the first part of my uh, talk now. And yeah, um, are there any questions in particular for uh, uh, regarding MG, MGCP? Okay, why the why the two media gateways? If the is it is it necessary if the BSC and MSC are co-located in the same physical hardware or network? Um, is it actually is it strictly necessary that there be two mm. media gateways? Mm. Yeah, the question was I don't have to re yeah. repeat it. It's on the uh, on tape anyway. Yeah, um, the um, oh, it's. Some noise. Um, yeah, in, in the answer is uh, no. It's uh, not really necessary to have two, but you you must have one. Um, since we are supporting uh, a, a model where dynamic endpoints are possible, um, you could use one uh, one uh, MGW with uh, with two call agents. They wouldn't interfere each other. They both would query for connections. They would basically issue a CRCX with uh, with uh, RTP bridge slash star. So just give me whatever endpoint is free, and then it gives the endpoint whatever endpoint is free to the one side. And if another side requests, it would give it a, give it another free endpoint. It's not like both sides uh, doing the endpoint assignment for themselves. That's that was the limitation with Osmo BSC MGCP and with, with the earlier versions of uh, of the MGW, um, but that problem is now solved, so it's uh, easily possible. To summarize, you can either run uh, separate Osmo MGW instances, one for the BSC, one for the MSC. You can also simply run one Osmo MGW that then is used by both the uh, BSC and the MSC. Yeah, exactly. Um, and uh, another level of the question is, why do both the MSC and the BSC need a media gateway, probably? And then uh, it was mentioned before that um, when the BSC does a handover, you want to stay transparent to the MSC. So a BSC needs to have a switch, a switchboard to do handover properly so that it doesn't need to tell the MSC anything about it. That's why the BSC has its separate MGW connection. And it can be a, its own MGW or it can be the same MGW that the MSC uses, but still it needs to have a, you know, a juncture. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, basically there were, uh, in the very early setups, we, we did it without MGW and then the handover Need to be needed to be re reintroduced, and then we exactly stumbled upon that problem. Uh, yes, one more. I, I don't know. It's, it's not a question. Just uh, uh, some feedback. I several days ago, I have uh, uh, I have uh, installed uh, MGV for split stack, and uh, I was not able to find any documentation. <laughs> So it's really uh, difficult to, mm. to configure because it's not obvious for, I, I think. 
Okay. Um, yeah, we are working on uh, providing documentation for that, uh, of course. Yeah, um, yeah, I see. Um, that's a real problem. So, uh, did you try um, the example files we, we ship with our uh, various Git repositories? Yes, finally, I <laughs> I mm. find a way to configure it and it works. So, mm. but mm. it's what not, not obvious. It yeah, I agree. These things are not yeah. obvious. It's it's. Um, Probably the problems we developers we, we have we think oh it's it's so simple but uh, yeah of course if yeah. somebody with no background oh, tries oh, it it's okay. uh, it's a different thing yeah. I understand that also uh, uh, it's another question I saw in documentation that uh, it should have some key, uh, some um, some version of Osmo Mux connector included, uh, should be included in MGV. Can you say some words about Os, You mean Osmo SIP connector? That oh, no, no, Osmo, Osmo Mux. Oh, yeah, um, that's uh, um, a problem. Osmo, Osmo, the Osmox um, is, there are fragments in the source code, but they do not work at the moment. Um, that is a feature that will be reintroduced at some later point again. But at the, in the current uh, version of the Osmo MGW, it's non-functional, basically. So um, we, we kept that in the code. Uh, we, we didn't remove it entirely because we uh, plan to uh, uh, fix that uh, at some later point. Um, but at the moment, it's, it's deliberately disabled. So Osmux, uh, the only working configuration at the moment is with Osmo BSC SCCP Lite and Osmo BSC NAT. That's basically where Osmux was originally written for and that's uh, used and tested and uh, Power just in the last couple of days he merged uh, some jitter buffer in there for, for uh, certain satellite links um, to hide the jitter from, from media gateways that don't deal well with lots of jitter. Um, uh, so that is uh, used in production, but uh, the reintroduction of this Osmux feature in Osmo MGW is uh, still on the to-do list at the moment. There's an open issue about it. Uh, so uh, regarding the, the mode where uh, you merge to uh, MGWs, so how does RTP actually uh, works in this way? So is it going to MGW, then goes to itself back, and then forward it? So is there any way to collapse this to save on CPU power? Because when you have quite a few uh, you know, RTP streams on uh, low power systems, that might be an issue. Um, so you, uh, you basically address the local switch problem if when we basically talk to ourselves so you no, no, it's, a, it's, not, it's not a, it's, it's not a uh, local call switching it's just when you have an ATB mode oh, right? so you yeah. have two MGWs in one right but uh, are in the current architecture as far as I understand uh, it's still logically yeah, yeah, two yeah, MGWs so, so mm -hmm. RTP is going to the first it goes from BTS to mm -hmm. MGW then it goes from MGW to MGW mm -hmm. so it basically mm -hmm. just goes through the loop back and then it goes fuser. Yeah, that's a co that's a logical consequence of the setup like this. Yeah, um, that would require an optimization. We would have to detect uh, that this stream in serial never could leave to the outside uh, and, and come back again. So we would forward it internally somehow. Um, it, that would be an idea to think about. But uh, yeah, as far <laughs> as far as far as it is now. Uh, we uh, didn't basically didn't implement this, but we thought about uh, doing that, and we we recognized the problem. I'm just curious, like how how difficult it is uh, in terms of the. Code. Yeah, it's not sort of difficult, but it requires uh, again some uh, implementation details, some uh, again some some other disc exception to handle, and yeah. That's, so. uh, that's, uh, that's because we, we are basically loaded uh, with, with other, uh, fixing other things and uh, making other things work. That, that's basically the, the problem. 
but yeah. So at the moment, it's it. basically about uh, making things work and fixing known bugs. And optimization can always be done, uh, but it's not uh, the top priority at the moment. Particularly in a non-transcoding case, I think uh, you would have to have a really mm. small system with lots of RTP streams that you really see some some performance issues there. So, um, uh, yeah, uh, it's an optimization. It has mm. two ways to do it. One of it is in the media gateway autonomously detect that basically there are two endpoints that just send to each other and then try to sort of optimize the path. Uh, and the other approach is basically to handle this at the BSC or the MSC level, um, uh, which of course requires uh, more intrusive changes, but that would basically map to the media gateway less operation, um, where uh, basically we skip some state transitions in the VSC and or the MSC to the media handling, so we can again work without a media gateway, and then you could configure, let's say, the BSC to not uh, do a media gateway, and only the MSC would use a media gateway, and then you again achieve the same. But that's, of course, more intrusive in terms of logic changes, but uh, both options are, are possible. Yeah, Yeah, but that's a separate talk about it, I think, at some point. Mm -hmm. as, uh, and I'm not sure how much it relates to so the question was about uh, LCLS, the local call, local switch uh, feature, but I think uh, we should wait uh, for that discussion until we cover that. Mm. Okay, um, so any more questions? We had lots of questions already about the Osmocom implementation. Uh, I think the first presentation was only about MGCP as a protocol, and the yeah, Osmocom no. part actually is what uh, what Philip wanted to present about now. So maybe okay. let's give him a chance uh, before yeah. uh, before uh, it's uh, become redundant by all the questions. Yeah, and yeah, we are only three minutes over time uh, for the first talk. It's fine. Um, yeah. <sighs> okay, now we are at the Osmo MGW, uh, our new Osmocom Media Gateway. Um, so, um, yeah, the Osmo MGW uh, Media Gateway um, is a relatively new uh, new member in the Osmocom family. Um, we introduced it in 2017 after we gave uh, Osmo BSC underscore MGCP a uh, good cleanup. And Basically, we, uh, we also removed the uh, hacks uh, which are contained in Osmo BSC MGCP. Those who are um, familiar with Osmo BSC MGCP probably might know Osmo BSC MGCP has some uh, auto detection of the other end. So it's basically when you create a connection, you create it only for one end. I believe it was the network side. And then it's there's some magic involved to um, auto detect your BTS, and there are formulas to calculate ports, and um, so that 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 is removed because it was a uh, rather difficult uh, setup. I think the origins of that is because Osmo BSC MGCP was used before in a very specialized setup where this kind of uh, hack was. Um, was appropriate, but um, yeah, since we were planning to make it into a real, um, real um, media gateway, we, there, there, there were some changes, some changes to be made. Um, yeah, I said it's um, it temporarily removes Osmox, and yeah, and as I said uh, before, we are we have now a dual ported endpoints, if, if you will. So. Uh, and the wildcarded DLCX things, which basically they can basically request the MGW to assign uh, whatever free endpoint to uh, to you. It, you do not get, you don't say uh, out of the blue like um, I want endpoint three. You just say I want any endpoint star, and then the media gateway gives you, for example, five. If that is the next free endpoint, it will give you that. Um, yeah. Um, 
the applications which use uh, the Osmo MGW, um, they do not have to implement the whole MGCP uh, protocol itself, even if it's a very simple protocol, requires still some handling, and um, Osmo MGW provides some tools uh, to simplify that. Um, basically, it provides you with the whole protocol stack. You just fill out some structs and uh, call some functions, and then that's it. So you do not have to implement um, the whole thing from scratch. And um, the libraries even come with a, with a, with a, uh, with, a, uh, with a, its own VTI. So as soon as you use uh, our libraries, uh, Osmo MGCP client, to, uh, to be precise. You will get uh, a ready made up uh, VTI in your application, so you don't have to worry about how how do I structure my my configuration interface and uh, so and this also provides some uniformity to the uh, to the um, Osmo Comp products, which is basically ensures you, you configure the MGCP part of the BSC of the MSC, you configure it all the same way. Um, yeah. So the API behind behind this in in, in MGCP client um, comes basically in two two different flavors. There may be situations where um, you need handcrafted MGCP messages for some specialized situations. Then uh, MGCP client uh, provides you with some um, some low-level API where you um, basically can do that, where you can handcraft an MGCP message, you send it, you get the response back, you pass that response, and basically do it all by yourself. You also have to uh, take care about the timeout handling as well there. So there's basically no, uh, no luxury about this, but you get a lot of implementation freedom. And recently we introduced uh, another way to, uh, to handle it, as we ourselves found that the low level way is pretty pretty complicated it's um pretty hard to uh to get everything right to handle the timeout correctly to uh, pass the response correctly and it repeats itself also very often things are very similar so that's why we um provide uh edit an, an, a new uh, kind uh, of way to doing that that's the m g c p client f s m and that's uh since you need an FSM anyway, if you do so, that kind of protocol handling, because how do you handle the timeouts, how do you handle all this, you do it with an Osmo FSM, of course. So that's um, why we uh, built upon that, so we made up a, a child FSM, which you can use in your already existing FSM, which, let's say, handles your um, subscriber or something. Um, so you can use that child FSM and it has abstract, it provides you with abstract commands. You can just say, um, can exactly do, basically corresponds to these three uh, commands, or command verbs we had in the beginning. It can make a connection, can modify it, and you can delete it. And um, basically, you very simply, you very roughly say, I want to make a connection with that IP, with that port, go ahead and do that. And if it if you fail, tell me that. Uh, tell me, uh, tell it to me by responding back with an with an MS, uh, with an FSM event with this FSM event. And if it if it uh, worked, give me another FSM event. So here we have uh, once more um, the model um, how that would work. You have the application, and inside this application, you uh, you have the MGCP client running, which does the request, sets up the connections on the endpoint, and routes your RTP stream. So, and now, um, basically, yeah, that's uh, we will go ahead with some practical examples. And um, I also have some um, because I wanted to make it easy for you to to use uh, Osmo MGW, so I think it's uh, sort of what's most, more interesting to show you how how you can control the MGW from your application rather than going to the technical details of the Osmo MGW itself. So um, 
and I've made up some examples for both A API flavors, which uh, which I can give you if you are interested. Uh, and then you, in, in, this, in this examples, you find some ready-made up uh, source code, which is which you can just compile and the script, which just uh, starts in MGW in the correct way, and then you can explore it and. Also, into the package also contains some uh, so a trace which which shows what's what messages are, messages are expected. So that's intended to provide some some kickstart if you want to implement uh, an application that needs an MGW can do it easily with, with our tools. And here we have our first uh, source code snippet. What that does is it uh, it basically does no, uh, nothing else than uh, just setting up uh, an MGCP message. So we find some things here. We are probably as we have a command about CSX, which basically means we want to make a CSX message in this case, and then we is that struct uh, we get uh, have a presence um, field. You have to look up in the uh, mgcp uh, uh, underscore client dot uh, h file the struct, but it's it's basically something like that. You have a presence field which basically says I have an endpoint in that message, I have a call ID, and I have a connection mode. So you have to since the the struct has uh, multiple fields, and you not use all of them with any requests. We introduce the presence flag, which you say. This struct it contains this, 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 and this, and the other stuff just ignores and ignored by the API. Um, and yeah, basically what I do there is I, I set up a call ID one two three four five six seven. That's my call ID. That's how I want to identify the call. I initially set a, a set this. That's to be precise. That's the value that I have to configure. I have to tell the MGW which call ID I have and the MGW will then respond back with, with the connection ID. So it's two different things that must not be mixed up. And I also say I want to make a loopback connection. So that will be a connection that basically whatever is sent to it via RTP, it's, it's just echoed back. And yeah, for the endpoint, um, it's a bit more interesting. I need to use an Osmo STRL copy to uh, copy a string to a buffer inside the struct. So it's not not all that nice. Um, yeah, and here we see the stars. So that's a wildcarded request. So that's uh, how I instruct the uh, MGW to um, basically um, ask it to give it give me any whatever is free. So and then once I have set set that up, I generate the message. And basically, what it does in this message buffer, it will just set up these these ASCII uh, uh, encoded uh, uh, via protocols. So that's basically, if you would do a printf with that uh, message with the data part of the message buffer, you would get exactly the string that is sent over the wire. It's just the MGCP messages. And if you execute the example, you can already see it. I've prepared. So if you run that, you basically see the message that goes over the wire. And then, yeah, since we have the message uh, prepared, we just send it and we give it an, a pointer to the MGCP client, which is initialized uh, before. It initializes from the configure file. You give it with the VTI and so on. So if a, it's basically your client instance, your client handle. You give it the, M, uh, you give it the message itself and you also give it uh, a callback function because somehow you want your response back. I want to know what what's the outcome of your uh, your request. If you are not interested, you can always issue a null pointer. That's okay. So let's say if you want to uh, DLCX for a last resort, you want to free. They are about to crash and want to free your source. You you could have a null there and just uh, basically say I don't care about the response, uh, whatever it is. So but but in this case, we care and we have a, a callback function for that. But before I look uh, exactly uh, how the callback function is structured, this is what we would get. Um, this is what it basically generates uh, when we uh, when we run that code. And you can 
see our call ID. Unfortunately, in the code, I use decimal, and uh, Wireshark depicts it in, in hexadecimal. But it's fine, it's our call ID, and um, some educated guess about the codec, which will be extended uh, later. At the moment, it's, uh, it's uh, fixed. And we also see a loopback, and we see our endpoint name. And the transaction ID, since this is, this, uh, the, when I made that, uh, this is the first message I sent, it's one. Um, so basically what happens if you resend an, a message, it's, it's UDP, you could run into timeout, so let's say you send your message and you never get a response, like you could try to do it, try it once more. Um, and what you then do is you just repeat the message with the same connection ID and the MGW will um, if it really didn't receive your message, uh, if everything will be okay, but let's say the response got lost and it received your message with CR, I've seen that before. I just respond the same way I responded before. So the send and receive logic is implemented inside Osmo MGW already, so you don't no need to worry about that. But at the moment, um, since we are using this uh, stuff on, on uh, basically locally everywhere, and if you lose UDP packet, packets while you are on the same, on the same machine, uh, that's, that doesn't happen in reality, and if it happens, <laughs> probably have some problem. Okay, let's see how we, how we dissect the response now. So that's the callback that gets called as soon as the client receives uh, the uh, response from the MGP, it executes your callback with some private data. And the first what you do would do is, uh, before you even pass it further, you would check your response, uh, your, um, your response code. So in this case, it's 200. It should be 200. If it's not 200, uh, your request is considered as failed. Um, so before you uh, call up the parser, you would check the response code and you would check if parsing is needed at all. <coughs> And then, when, when you discovered everything's fine, you would pass the response with uh, MGCP response pass param. And yeah, basically then you get the results, port, the address, the endpoint name you got issued by the, uh, from the uh, MGW, um, and your connection ID. The connection ID is set is very important. You have to memorize that when you want to, deleting is not so difficult, but if you want to modify later, you need that. Um, okay, let's have a look at the response now. I've marked the interesting <laughs> section. So this is what came back uh, in response to uh, to the message we, we sent via the client. So we see our 200. Okay, we see the we see that the MGW assigned M.0. See the connection ID. We see the IP address. It where it expects. Uh, RTP data, see the port. So, yeah. That's the, that's the um, low level way to do it. And you also, if you, if you do it that way, you also can run in a very difficult situation. Imagine your, um, your MGW answers late because there's some load on, on the MGW, it answers late, and um, your, um, your logic, your protocol logic already decided um, it's timed out and our resources are freed. It will call the callback anyway, and it will dereference uh, null pointers. So the, the IPI, of course, provides a way to cancel pending messages. And you have to remember to do that when you run into the timeout. You have to deliberately ask the, the logic behind the client to, uh, to remove your message. Uh, so basically, you don't, that you do not expect an answer anymore in case the MGW answers late. That won't really happen in the reality, but it could. So, but... Um, there are ways to, to get around to do it much more comfortable. And uh, that's the MGCP client FSM. 
And since uh, when we discuss this example, since this has to be used from an FSM, so there's no other way. Since this comes as a client FSM, which you instantiate inside an parent FSM, we need to come up with some simple state machine bodies. And in this case, it just consists of one single state, which just loops around, and hopefully it won't uh, won't die. So we agree on basically four signals to start we have a signal which we very very inst uh, uh, I will mention that later in the code that's so better if you want to if you're interested in a real world example you could uh, look at have a look at the um, subscriber connection FSM in the uh, in the BSC that's where we exactly use that kind of uh, model uh, for the previous example, um, the MAC still uses the old-fashioned um, low-level way. So both uh, both things are in the wild, and um, there are real-world examples for that. So we start with the we, very, we start very similar. Um, uh, we start very similar to the. Uh, MGCP client, um, but in this uh, yeah in this case we, we we just we start by filling up the uh, a struct with with the message parameters we we need. So in this case um, again we have the wildcarded request here, and um, we agree on a call ID. We have uh, the IP address and the port. That's uh, stuff we want to pack in our request. But in this case, we it's, it's more abstract. So it's basically what we do. We configure a connection. So we we configure on which endpoint it should run, which caller it should have, which on which port we we expect uh, the uh, the da the RTP data to arrive. And yeah, and then we basically tell the MGCP client. Uh, a client underscore FSM to be precise. Um, that uh, this connection shall be created now, and basically that returns us an FS Osmo FSM instance. And here we see, here we have again as a pointer to the our MGCP uh, client. Uh, it's, it's the same as with the MGCP. Uh, uh, the same as the uh, in the um, example before. That's our pointer to the MGCP client logic. And um, we give it the pointer to the to the parent FSM. So basically, that reference the FI here references our our parent FSM. So the simple body FSM I depicted before. That's it. And we agree on two uh, two events. Yes, Osmo FSMs are basically yeah, event controls. They need events. Um, we agree on one event, which hopefully never occurs. That's when we, when the MGCP client underscore FSM uh, discovers some problem, it, it will die. And then we get this event back, and then we can handle accordingly. So tearing down some other connections or do whatever is needed to, uh, to uh, make our emergency uh, landing. And we also agree on a on a success event, which basically is in our case we we say this uh, should be the e, e event got CR6 uh, response, and we basically expect this event here to be transmitted to our parent FSM, so we can move on. So then we know the connection is created, and we we can do the other stuff. And here we give it a pointer to the connection info. That's just a local variable that. Uh, uh, which I just zeroed out before to be sure. It's just filled here, so it's, there's no, uh, no hidden catch here. Um, yeah, and then let's see what happens exactly when we execute that. And it looks familiar to us. Again, we, we just, it just generates the uh, message. It, um, Again, we have the wildcard uh, endpoints and the ports and the call ID. That all gets generated automatically. Um, and if we are lucky, we get the response back. 
and um, yeah, basically uh, the the MGCP client underscore FSM can uh, receive the response and pass it. Um, underneath all this, uh, underneath the MGCP client FSM, uh, the regular MGCP client uh, does its work. So this is uh, basically an, an overhaul for that um, uh, to, to provide a com more comfortable interpret. Technically, it's the same as you've seen before. It will just uh, internally. Uh, uh, handle it, creates a message, send it, and take care about the timeout and have its own, as I said, it's a, it's a child FSM, it's its own little FSM that basically handles all the nasty stuff for you. And yeah, if you are lucky enough, we get uh, the uh, got CRCX uh, response event back, and um, yeah, then we can just uh, pick up. Uh, the response uh, information from from the struct. That's it. There's no. Uh, it's not not very difficult to. So uh, it's just just uh, read the struct out and that's it. You don't even need to to pass things. And yeah, in this example, I just set up a new thing. So I want to modify the connection. Uh, in this example, so I want uh, so I set it up. Um, how I wanted to have how I want to have the uh, connection to be modified, and then I just call MGCP con modify, and um, I have again to agree on uh, on an event which I get back. These events basically take the role of the call callbacks in uh, in MGCP underscore client. Um, so I agree on 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 these uh, that I, on these events that I get the EV got uh, MG. MDCX response. Once I got that back, you know, uh, my my uh, attempt to modify the connection was processed uh, correctly. We don't need to re-agree on on this on a failure event. So the EV uh, FSM died. Uh, that's already agreed when I connect the when I create the connection, it memorized that. So there's no need to to do that twice. So that's uh, memorized and. If something fades during the modification, it, it, you will get the diet event back, and then you can do your emergency landing there as well. Um, yeah, and then simple as uh, as the same as before, you you just would pick up uh, what the MGCP, uh, what the Osmo MGW responded, and then finally you could. Uh, in theory, delete your connection. And this example, I deleted immediately. And there, I don't have to agree on any events. So um, in this model, I'm not really interested to know if uh, if it's deleted. If there is an error, I will we get the died event back. And if it's uh, fine, uh, oh no 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 no, that's wrong. Then I delete uh, the um, the uh, connection. Um, that's that's a trick here because uh, as I delete it and then the um, uh, the uh, child FSM will unlink it for itself from the parent. We do all the nasty work itself. So if it should die, it, it will die uh, for itself. So as soon as I do the delete, I don't have to. I don't need to care about whatever happens there. So I can just tear down, move on with my my uh, tear down process and see. I, I just terminate the parent FSM there and go ahead. Um, so you just can, if you if you don't need some connection anymore, you just throw it away, and it will uh, will help itself. Um, that also provides a lot of comfort. So you, because in the, in the if the if your parent FSM is modeling a more complicated protocol. There will be lots and lots of uh, error situations and situations where errors can occur and imagine if you would have to take care about properly freeing MGW resources there. So there you can just call the function and then it's gone. Um, yeah. So now I'm through. We have a few minutes left. So are there questions? I hope that was understandable. Whoever is interested can get the uh, example code for me, and I also could help if, if it doesn't work on your machine. Um, I think I will upload that in the wiki anyway, so we'll find it later at the points in the wiki where we um, 
where we have your our MGW stuff. Um, yeah, other questions? I have one more question. Uh, is it possible uh, to to get or to export any RTP statistic from uh, Osmo MGV because it's very important when you use system in production. To, you mm. should s somehow to, to detect to, to define mm. the issue. Yes, there is. Um, in the um, in the MGW in particular, we. Uh, at the moment, many of the counters you're probably interested in um, are still uh, handcrafted, so we are working on um, porting that over to uh, Osmocom rate counters, so you could read it out at any time. And um, when you delete connections uh, separately, also in the RTP, uh, in the MGCP uh, DL6 response, it will add you some uh, statistics. But yeah, we are we are. Uh, working on that so basically the um, the RT the RTCP statistics and the statistics um, uh, that the media gateway itself generates which it also sends back in RTCP uh, of course all the time uh, to the to the uh, of one node those uh, should get or I think they are already aggregated in the DLCX uh, so so when the when you delete the connection basically that uh, information is returned back now we don't have anything mm. in Osmo BSC or Osmo MSC that uses that information in any way, but on a protocol level, the MGW sends this statistics information basically when you tear down the connection. Or you can also, I think, from a protocol point of view, you think you can also, when you audit the endpoint, or there's some some kind of request in an ongoing mm. connection, how the call agent or any call mm. agent could request some some information about the ongoing uh, call. At the moment, it's the, um, it's the TS, uh, TS error, I think, it's a timestamp error. If there's a timestamp error, it would be counted. Um, the patch is uh, really recent. I, I, I first uh, I ported over exactly one, um, one counter to be sure that uh, the, the model, how I'm doing it's right, and then the next thing I will do there is uh, to a port over the remaining counters. Yeah, yeah. but the, the the porting of those counters is independent of the reporting that happens on the protocol level. These counters yes. are just so with the control interface, you can also extract mm. uh, the information if you're interested in that, but that's mm. independent of what happens on the protocol okay. level. And I think mm. on the protocol level, um, what currently happens is that uh, the media gateway just works as a proxy for both RTP and RTCP. Um, so it's basically the, the OSIP uh, implementation on the BTS side or on whatever on the other side is sending its statistics in RTCP and we just uh, pass them through from left to right. Mm -hmm. Because on our, like the current implementation, which is for historical reasons, like Osmo BSG, M BC, MGW, is basically just a UDP proxy. Um, it's not actually terminating the RTP or interpreting it in any way, unless you would enable transcoding, which is already present, but we haven't tested it, so it's most likely mm. broken uh, uh, in the current code. Probably. Yeah. yeah um, but uh, Osmo BSG MGW, the predecessor, already had support mm. for transcoding in there. Um, mm. Then it's different, but in the normal uh, having two RTP connections on one endpoint uh, mode, you just pass uh, the, the data uh, left and right. And um, we do. Um, um, well, yes. You, otherwise, we couldn't detect the timestamp uh, mm -hmm. uh, drops and things like that. Um, but uh, it's not uh, like on an RTP protocol level. It's not really terminating the protocol. It's really just passing through. I mean, we 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 look at some header fields, but uh, we are not uh, acting as a as the the end node for the RTP really. Right, and and on the as I said on the on the BTS side, I mean, I'm not sure if you ever looked at it, but Osmo BTS uh, sends plenty of statistics in the uh, in in RTCP all the time, um, which is basically what what LibOSIP is generating all the time. Uh, uh, ORTP, yes, sorry, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, then, uh, thanks to Phil. Oh, oh sorry, yeah. Uh, one more question. Uh, is there already a way to control uh, port allocation uh, for MGW? Because it's important when you are exporting, um, uh, basically for firewalling and uh, etc. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, we. It is, uh, it is controllable. We, uh, you can define a port range uh, in the configuration. So basically you can narrow it down which ports uh, should be used. And the old fashioned Osmo BSC underscore MGCP basically had more options than that. They, uh, there we had uh, port pre allocation. So it would, at the moment where Osmo BSC MGC, uh, MGCP starts, it would allocate all the ports. And then that, that would be a fixed endpoint resource. But in the way uh, the way Asmi MG uh, W now works, is the only possible way to narrow it down would be up uh, a supplier range. We are actually do that in our test set of this way because we have to we have to have some some uh, gate uh, some uh, port port ranges so that we won't interfere accidentally. So yes, this is possible, but you cannot predict. Which port a connection it uh, uh, will get next? That we pick whatever is free from that defined range. No, that, that we don't need to predict. We just need to mm. be able to map those ports mm. to, for example, from internal IP address to an external IP address. Yeah, yeah that would be uh, possible, I think. So I'm just wondering if. Um, in the research into MGCP and building the media gateway, if um, any of other third-party products have been looked at, you know, I'm thinking, for example, of um, RTP Engine, which um, is mainly used with the Camellio SIP proxy, mm -hmm. and I haven't really used it. I'm using the previous, uh, not really previous version, but previous incarnation. So the RTP Engine, I understand, is a user space daemon that uh, also uh, does transcoding and also talks to an in-kernel module if it can to do like uh, mm -hmm. direct packet forwarding at that level. But it's probably really designed for stuff where you have many thousands of simultaneous RTP streams. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm, I think it's, it's controlled from Camaelio by something called the RTP proxy module language, which is really some similar stuff sending STP. Mm -hmm. um, but there might be some things in there that um, are useful, maybe, and uh, maybe not. At the same mm -hmm. time, it's nice to have your own stuff, right? Yeah. That you don't have to fix something that some other product is not supplying for you and you mm -hmm. just have complete control yourself. But I'm, that, I, I don't know, maybe, I'm just asking if, if, you, mm -hmm. if, if it's been looked at, because maybe if Osmo um, MTCP client could ultimately control something like RTP Engine, it might mm. be useful to somebody. Uh, I point. think um, the MGCP client is at the moment very much tied to MGCP. Um, I'm aware there are some of some uh, alternatives to MGCP, but uh, yeah, I have to confess. Uh, yeah, we started out with MGCP with Osmo BC MGCP that was already there, and um, I continued uh, developing and building on that. The important part to note is that um, actually uh, the, we, we soon hopefully will have uh, real media gateway support, so E1 and T1 support in there, and I don't think you can find anything uh, out there uh, because that it's actually one of the talks uh, coming up later today is about reintroducing E1 support, um, and uh, then you need not only RTP left and right, uh, but you actually need to understand uh, E1 interfaces and 64 kilobit slots and 16 kilobit subslots and, and all that stuff that used to be in Osmo NITB. Um, in terms of free software implementations of um, media gateways that speak MGCP, I don't think there is any, but of course there are lots of uh, proprietary media gateways that speak MG, uh, MGCP. Um, so uh, you can find quite a number of uh, Cisco uh, voice gateways, for example, that uh, speak MGCP as one of the control protocols. 
Um, and uh, uh, that's uh, we haven't really tested interoperability with that yet. We have bought one of these units, so we can test interop if we want to, but uh, hasn't hasn't reached that point yet. Mm -hmm. uh, just as a, a future uh, feature request, uh, it would be nice to uh, also have support for something like HEP in, uh, in MGW to uh, export RTP uh, information to external uh, monitors uh, for uh, quality uh, purposes. Just something to think about like for, 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 for the roadmap. Whatever people send patches for. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's also very easily to build that up on the control interface. I mean, since it's an EPA multiplex, there's example Python code for that. You could write a wrapper in theory. Okay, good. We are over time already with this time slot, oh. so I suggest uh, we move on, unless somebody has an urgent question left. Okay, thanks, Philip. That's clear. Thanks,